Greetings, everyone. I am honored and excited today to be interviewing Rick Leskowitz. And let me give you a little bit of his background, and then we'll dive into an interview together. And in particular, I'd like to focus on his latest book, The Mystery of Life Energy, Biofield Healing, Phantom Limbs, Group Energetics, and Gaia Consciousness. And it's a great book. But um, formally, he's known as Eric Gleskowitz. He's a retired Harvard Medical School affiliated psychiatrist who practiced for over 25 years at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital Pain Management Program in Boston. He's the author of three textbooks, has published more than 50 peer review articles, and has just recently published this book, The Mystery of Life Energy. And Rick, I'm really excited to do this with you today and very impressed with the depth and breadth of what you've integrated in terms of your, you're a longtime meditator, you've studied different forms of energy healing, clinical hypnosis, you've explored earth energies, global consciousness, and you weave all of that together in your book, which is extraordinary. So thank you for being here today. Well, thank you, Heather, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you about subjects that are near and dear to my heart. I have to um, admit that one thing came to mind when you talked about the, the breadth of my experience. I went to a liberal arts college, and the guarantee there was you'd be able to talk knowledgeably about any topic for two minutes, <laughs> <laughs> but not, not so much on the depth. So I hope I have a little bit more than two minutes depth on some of these topics. But yeah, it's it's just been a very interesting journey, as they say, to go from, you know, I was trained in conventional medicine. But um, I think what what made the difference for me was that I took some time off between my pre-med training in college and going to medical school and did some traveling and saw that different people do things differently around the world. And our view of health, illness, reality is not the only one. And so uh, I, I came back sort of ready to explore and um that it's it's just it just seemed like the logical thing to do because i remember in early years in medical school being very disappointed because they didn't really have good explanations for why this person got that disease at this particular time there were there was a lot of very impressive terminology you know latin and greek words like everything was idiopathic i remember that one mm -hmm which is a fancy way of saying we don't know what's going on, <laughs> which was not all that satisfying. I mean, you could impress people at cocktail parties with big words, but it didn't really get to the get to the root of it. And so I, you know, I was open for other things. Um, this was in the yeah, the late 70s, when things like stress were just being considered as a as a issue in health. And uh, meditation was, I, ha I had learned how to meditate just before starting medical school. And so I was asking, you know, after every lecture, would meditation help this disease? And nobody knew because there were like two studies on meditation in the total literature. And so it was totally open-ended. It's, it's amazing how much things have changed now that there are literally thousands of studies on meditation. So I think for me, <laughs> meditation was the thin end of the wedge as they say, and, you know, it sort of opened up other ways of looking at things. Um, as far as the energy piece of it goes, um, what really shifted for me was when a friend, um, a, a, psycho a, a psychotherapist who I respected, invited me to come to a lecture on energy healing. And to me, that just sounded very, you know. Uh, Out there in left field. Yeah, way, <laughs> way past the bleachers. Yeah. So, uh, but I, you know, I, I respected him. So I went and this was a woman named Rosalind Bruyere, who's based in the West Coast, but came east a lot to talk. And um, she was just so impressive because literally she could speak both languages. She, she knew enough about medicine because she worked with the doctors in Los Angeles, but she also knew about the energy and she could see a whole other level of reality that wasn't even mentioned, wasn't even acknowledged in medical school. And that just totally fascinated me. So I studied with her for quite a while in the 80s. She would come east for two um, 
intense as a year. And there was a group of about 40 or 50 of us who were the regulars. And um, there were some very, very talented people there who I came to trust, trust their perceptions. I, it was actually a humbling experience for me because in a way, from an energy point of view, I was the dumbest kid in the class. <laughs> I couldn't perceive a lot of the stuff that everybody else was sensing because I was so, you know, cognitive and head oriented. But, you know, gradually I sort of descended down, <laughs> down into my body and began to experience, get some glimpses of what these guys are talking about. But for me, that just showed that there's a whole parallel track to um, understanding health and illness. And um, that sort of guided my practice. I, my first job out of psychiatry training was at the VA hospital and clinic in Boston and post-traumatic stress. We really didn't know what to do with it. And I have subsequently learned some energy based techniques that would have been fabulous 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And that's sort of not fair to call it a regret, but I wish we had had that option back then. And then, um, as you mentioned, I moved to Spalding rehab hospital <clears throat> 1990 and worked in pain management which was actually a perfect forum for exploring all this because the patients were were referred to us because the doctors admitted they didn't know what to do so it's kind of a green light to try anything and you know we started with at the time it was very far out to do biofeedback and meditation but gradually um, you know one of our doctors had studied acupuncture so we brought that in one of the physical therapists did energy balancing. So we gradually brought in the whole um, energy spectrum of stuff in a, you know, it was the, it was the outpatient clinic it was very far removed from the center. <laughs> so we, we weren't totally scrutinized, but um, a, a lot changed because we were able to do that. And we had some very important advances in understanding pain, health, and energy. And I'll talk about a, a little bit later one of the um, pain syndromes that I was most interested in was uh, phantom limb pain. Mm -hmm. But for now, um, actually, wh why don't you show a couple of the early slides? Because there's a theme that I talk about in the book of how, um, you know, the, the, West, the medical model is changing and has changed over the year and resists change over the years. That top image uh, of the woman in the box is... Um, from about probably 60 years ago. I can't remember exactly, but a, a very famous uh, doctor named Wilhelm Reich was a student of Sigmund Freud and Freud was interested in libido and um, Reich focused on the sexual aspect of it, which he called orgone. And he believed that it, moving this energy was the secret to health. And he developed forms of therapy that actually nowadays are part of um, you know, like bioenergetic therapy and body-centered therapy. So he really opened the door to that. This is a picture of a box that he developed, layers of wood and metal that he believed can concentrate um, this energy. And the woman inside is, is about to be getting a session. Um, this came to the attention. He actually started in Germany, left Germany, with the rise of Nazism and came to America and had about 10 years of growing practice when the Food and Drug Administration got very concerned that he was using this to treat cancer. And they cracked down on him so harshly that um, he actually, it was a sting operation, but he was um, found to have uh, transported devices across state lines or something like that. And so his books were confiscated. There was a mass book burning over a ton of his books were burned. It's the first time the federal government has supported uh, book burning and hopefully the last time, although there's some <laughs> current trends towards <laughs> the book burning direction. But um, so he, he was imprisoned and he actually died in prison um, without the opportunity to vindicate himself. And it, it's happened before in Western medicine. There's uh, Franz Mesmer is somebody I got really interested in, the, the developer of mesmerism, but, but animal magnetism. This was in the 1770s when Europe was fascinated with new discoveries about electricity and magnetism. And he basically said, well, maybe living organisms had this magnetism too. And he learned to channel it with his hands and became a very popular doctor in Paris. 
pulled away all the wealthy clients from the other doctors. Something had to be done about that. And so they put together a royal commission that was the it was it, two sides. The deck was stacked against him, but they did a very cool, really a research study where they had subjects given um, these mesmeric passes, just smoothing out what we would call smoothing out the biofield now. Um, but the, the subjects didn't know they were blindfolded, so they didn't know whether they were getting real treatment or not. And um, that's a cool, you know, innovation to, to test things that way. But um, the main intervention was being given by a doctor who had been had been a disciple, but was told if you continue to pursue mesmerism, we're going to kick you out of the Royal Academy. So he obviously, <laughs> you know, experimenter bias. Anyway, they they found that the people who got better, it was suggestion, no evidence for animal magnetism. And so he was run out of town. Um, and that, that happened with a lot of pioneers like that. Yes, yes. It's actually a surprisingly common theme. And we're going through something similar now. Um, actually, the next slide, please. Um, it shows how social media can be used to enforce censorship. This is uh, the website traffic of a holistic psychiatrist named Kelly Brogan from 2019. And you can see there's a huge drop off. That happened the week that um, Google changed their search algorithm so that natural health type approaches were shunted way aside. And you can see it. it she lost like 95% of her traffic. Next slide shows um, in, in our hospital, we've we've had a series of lectures. I mean, th this is from a while ago. I mean, nowadays, almost any hospital anywhere will have lectures on integrative medicine and uh, mind-body medicine, things like that. So it's nothing unique now. But this, this is from, uh, this is probably the most unusual lecture we've ever had at Spalding because the fellow pointing at those diagrams is actually the team parapsychologist for the Iraqi Olympic Committee. Now that's a job description that I had never <laughs> imagined before. You know, we came across each other because he saw something of my writings and we corresponded, but he uses his energy perceptions to work with the athletes and he can literally diagnose who needs to be pumped up and then he does some treatments on them and pumps them up and um so it just shows with a a total open viewpoint what what's what's possible and it was just really wonderful <laughs> to have him come and, uh, and explain some of what he was doing um the the next slide um I, i'm not sure how how familiar this will be to viewers but um about 40 years ago, uh, th this is a picture of a, a maple leaf taken with a camera called a Curlian photography, and it shows the electrostatic field around living objects. And that's that's not controversial. That's a known phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting was in this study, they cut off the tip of this leaf and took another image. And the, what they call a corona discharge is still there around the edge of the leaf, which you wouldn't really expect. You'd think that uh, the leaf somehow generates, you know, whether it's because of the water or the chlorophyll or whatever, it creates some kind of electrical boundary. But the electrical boundary is there even in the absence of the leaf. So what does that mean? Um, I think that's one of the most significant images in, I don't want to get too grandiose, but I mean, the implications of this are huge because it seems to say that the energy uh, boundary or template comes first and the physical structure follows suit. So yeah. it's a bit like, if you go to the next slide, it's like um, every, everybody knows this, you know, you probably did this experiment in seventh grade or whatever. You sprinkle iron filings on a piece of paper with a magnet underneath it, and they form this really beautiful geometric pattern. The lines of force are invisible to the naked eye, but the iron filings line up in accordance to them. And I think it's a perfect analogy to that, uh, what they call the phantom leaf effect, that you can imagine sweeping away some of the iron filings in the upper corner of this diagram, for example, so that there's nothing visible, but the lines of force are still there. And I think the cells in the leaf 
and the cells in the human body are the same as these iron filings, that they line up in accordance with an invisible energy field, which I think is the, you know, the acupuncture meridians, the biofield, and all of that. So this really um, leads into, there's a clinical, uh, no, I can't remember if, maybe I don't have a slide of it. Go one more just to quickly. No, go go back. I'm sorry. Go back to the. To this the relates phantom. to your phantom limb research, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But I thought I, I didn't have a, a photo or image to, to to direct that. But that that's what I will say is that for me, the working at, at clinically, the the really the most fascinating form of chronic pain is phantom limb pain, and that's people who've had an amputation. Commonly, will feel like the the arm is still there. But less commonly, they'll also have severe pain where the arm used to be. And it feels like it's out there where the fingers and hand used to be. Although, obviously, there's no nerves there. There's no tissue there. So the medical model is that the brain remembers past sensations and the cerebral cortex constructs an image of what used to be there. And that explains some of it. But there aren't any good treatments that, that have come about from the medical model as far as injections and uh, medications and things like that. So my my thinking on phantom pain changed. There's, there was actually one patient, one day, one session that really was the... And um, actually, I know you have a background in astrology. It'd be interesting to see if I can remember what day that was and what, what stars were in alignment <laughs> for both of us, because he was somebody who wasn't doing particularly well in our program. Um, he had a uh, above the knee amputation. So I said, do you want to try something different? So he he lay down on the examining table. I told him, just close your eyes and relax. I'm going to smooth out your, I forget what I call it, aura or energy field or something like that. So I did basically what Mesmer did. It's, it's modern version is called therapeutic touch, but I smoothed out the space around him. Now, um, pe- people who are watching, actually, you can you can do this. If you just bring your hands closer and far apart, at some point, you'll feel something. It's not the temperature and it's hard to say what it really is, but um, <clears throat> this is what, what we believe is the biofield. So I was getting that sensation over his body, smoothing it out. And for some reason, I just continued down to where his leg was not anymore. And I could feel the exact same precious tingling sensation. Where his leg was missing. And, um, you know, so I was, whoa but even more maybe even more impressively he opened his eyes and said what are you doing because he could feel me touching his phantom leg Mm. so yeah so somehow his biofield was transmitting sensations to his brain apart from whatever nerves there were or weren't there so a lot really high you know as i smoothed it out he could feel the pain draining out from the bottom of his phantom foot and then he actually asked me to stop because it was so unsettling to lose that sensation of pain because he would lose the sensation of that leg being there. And he was a younger guy in his 30s, sort of, I guess you would say macho. And it was very challenging to his self-image to think that he truly, really deeply does not have a leg. So for his psychological balance, you could say, the pain actually served a positive function. So we stopped and, um, you know, we talked about it in a few other sessions, but um, it didn't go further than that. But for me, it really opened up the notion that phantom limb is the perfect way to study um, biofields. And we're working with Curly and photography to um, get images of the the phantom foot or finger or whatever analogous analogous to the phantom leaf. And it's been very hard to replicate for a number of reasons. I'm I'm working now with some of the top, oh, what would you call them? Gizmo guys uh, and, and gals, <laughs> Beverly Rubik too, but um, to, 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 to fine tune this, to see if we can get images, replicate the phantom leaf or get images of the phantom hand or something like that. Because did I you think, try that treatment on other people and did it sustain if they continued to do that kind of uh, therapeutic touch or Reiki on the phantom limb? Um, what I found most helpful was actually a self-administered treatment where the patient taps on their own acupuncture points 
while they think about upsetting events and you know an amputation is very upsetting so obviously there's a lot of emotional trauma that surgeons do not <laughs> acknowledge so um by helping them to release the emotional charge of the amputation patients could lose their phantom pain it was actually you know, I've, I've, I've written about it in one of the resources there's links to some of the papers because it's 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 beautiful i mean really to see how something so simple can when you acknowledge the energy dimension it just changes everything about how you approach it so well, that's that was, rick in that you're both addressing the physical pain but also the ptsd the the trauma that needed to clear to support their healing on all levels right no exactly it's so um phantom limb pain is really a physicalized form of ptsd and it really echoes the the title of Bessel van der Kolk's well-known book about PTSD, The Body Keeps the Score, that, you know, yes. the, the limb holds the trauma until the person is given a way to, to release it. So it was, you know, it's it was wonderful to do the clinical discovery, but I'm really curious about finding a way to get an image of that because, because I think it would be really uh, an eye-opener for a lot of people. So um, let, let me move on. Yeah, I, so so there are, um, when, when individual people learn how to circulate their own energy, they can get into these altered states of consciousness. And in sports, it's known as being in the zone of peak performance. And this, this is, you know, it's just, it's obviously just two football players who are diving, but it looks like they're levitating. And there's actually a whole... Uh, Michael Murphy, the man who uh, co-founded Esalen Institute, he wrote about the cities. These are the, the it's the um, yoga term for supernormal abilities that come from uh, body, mind, energy, and spirit alignment. So there's a there's a whole literature about extraordinary performance that comes when your energies are aligned. So that's that's at the individual level. The next the next slide shows something about the group interactions around energy. Um, this is a, a laboratory study that uh, was done. I'm the blindfolded guinea pig, and I'm, I'm hooked up to a machine that's measuring my heart rate, or actually the rhythm of it, according to um, the heart is not a metronome, and it varies, mm -hmm. um, rate varies every few seconds. So there's a, a normal cycle to it that um, people at the Heart Math Institute have studied, calling it heart coherence. And they, their hypothesis is that um, human beings are surrounded by a magnetic field and they interact and the heart rhythm should be interactive too. So you can just barely see the computer screen to the left of my head. It's recording my heart rate variability. Um, I was sitting there alone, um, blindfolded and with earplugs and record. they recorded my baseline. And then at some point unknown to me, these four people came and sat behind me and they entered into their form of heart coherent meditation and to see if it would have any effect on me. And <laughs> I guess I would say, believe it or not, it did. And my, um, let's see if I can, yeah, my heart coherence uh, went sky high within, within seconds of them starting their meditation. So it was a very literal physiologic example of how human interactions um, occur across empty space. This is just, you know, five people, but, you know, everybody's been in larger group settings um, and felt just how powerful, how extraordinary it can be. It can be a positive, exalting kind of thing, or it can be very um, negative and coarse. And, you know, there are plenty of examples in history where a negative crowd energy can uh, spur on events to the detriment of everybody. So it, it it's, it's a lot like tuning forks. That's actually another good metaphor. It depends what frequency you set the tuning forks at to resonate. This this particular study, that they were in a heart-centered meditation. Uh, um, uh, appreciation and compassion was the, the vibe that they were putting out. And I was resonating to it, um, even apart from my five physical senses. That's what the cool thing was. It was apart from my five physical senses. So that's the, you know, the the model for the 
And yeah. it really fits with Rupert Sheldrake's work on morphogenic fields that we can, if we're in a group meditation or we're holding a certain consciousness or frequency, that it can really emanate out and impact the collective consciousness. Absolutely. And that's that's the 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 exciting sort of final step on this, that this this work was I, I was <laughs> Uh, I'm a sports fan and grew up in the Boston area, and there was some very big sports breakthroughs. And uh, it's actually almost 20 years ago now, but our baseball team, the Boston Red Sox, won the World Series for the first time in a gazillion years. And everybody was just carried on this wave of enthusiasm. And I and I got interested in it as a fan, but also saw that it illustrated a lot of these energy principles that I was working on. So um, I collaboration with my cousin a filmmaker we put together a film about group energies in sports and this this picture of the the experiment at heart math was is from that film um that shows the different ways in which group energies can be generated and can be measured and um it, it we we call the film the joy of socks and um it's actually available now on youtube you just google the joy of socks and it's uh just under an hour. It was on PBS, which was actually very cool to, to get it out there. And it turns out this is a this is a more, what would you say, socially acceptable way of talking about energy. It's not woo-woo, <laughs> because you know, my favorite baseball player does it. And there's actually one of the guys, I interviewed the catcher of the Red Sox, and he demonstrates how he tapped on himself. So, you know, that was beautiful. Uh, yeah, it was it was actually wonderful to do. Um so that was that was how I got started. But uh, you know, as you mentioned, group energies, groups can be bigger than just five people in a lab or thirty-five people at Fenway Park watching a baseball game. So um, that led to the next uh, level of things. And right, this next slide shows how uh, I bridge the gap. Um, just as an aside, <laughs> I guess I'll say it this way. Um, uh, my wife is an alien. She's actually from England. And there was just, a, she'll kill me for saying this, but when we were uh, applying for her visa to come to America to visit, um, she's British. When she, so when we applied at the embassy, um, I was answering a few of the questions that the the, the bureaucrat was asking and he, he wanted her to answer. So he said, let the alien speak. <laughs> You know, we can laugh. We laugh about it now, but at the time we were young and very intimidated and didn't didn't know what to say. But apart from all that, I got to visit England a lot because her family and friends are there. And I learned things that I never knew about England. And one of them, you know, I think everybody's heard about some of the famous places like Stonehenge and Avebury, the stone formations. But it turns out they're scattered throughout England in a non-random way. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a map. It's a, it's a little it's a little bit too small to to read, but um, if you buy my book, you'll be able to see it in larger <laughs> font. But it shows that there are um, this one particular alignment um, includes things like stone circles, uh, pagan uh, sites, holy wells, churches. They're all, you know. They're all along these lines. They're called ley lines, L-E-Y lines. It was categorized by a um, surveyor about a hundred, over 100 years ago. And it gave rise to the notion that um, the earth has energy pathways, just like human beings. And this would be the analog of a um, <clears throat> human acupuncture meridian. And each of those sites would be... a, a uh, uh, an acup an acupoint or even a, a chakra, one of the main energy centers. So that became, um, you know, really, uh, there's a whole, there's actually a longer tradition in Europe called geomancy, which is yes. the, study, the study of the Earth's energies. But this became much more focalized and um, specific. It's yeah, very and take the St. Michael's line and then the St. Mary's line. I've explored them and they carry very different energies. And I've done interviews with Rory Duff, who goes into great depth about the Earth energy lines. But this is a particularly powerful area. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, you mentioned that you could sense the different qualities of the energy. 
And that's that's one of the the challenges is that you know I believe you and I I'm sure that you do what you sense is something valid, but skeptics will say, yeah, but does it show up on a Geiger counter or a, you know EKG machine or whatever? So it's the challenge of finding objective documentation that parallels the subjective findings. And with Earth energies, we're not quite there yet. There are definitely magnetic field anomalies and even even radioactivity and uh, uh, negative ions in the air. So, so things things correlate, um, but it does fit the model that um, you know indigenous people have peoples have been saying for millennia that the Earth is a living being, a conscious being. You know, we tend to think of it in the West as you know, rocks and water and dirt and things like that. More recently, there's the Gaia hypothesis, which is at least an analogy, an analogy to that, um, you know, forests are like lungs and rivers are like circulation of the blood, things like that. But it's not all the way to energy and consciousness. But I think phenomena like, like this are starting to pull us in this direction. And that what really, for me... <laughs> I guess you could say knocked me over the edge was um, this, uh, I guess it's mostly in the last 30 years uh, in some of the wheat fields of Southern England, right? Um, overnight, these odd patterns, beautiful, complex geometric patterns will appear in the fields. Um, the top part of that picture, the, the green circular area is the stone circle known as Avebury. Which is actually the largest stone circle in Europe. It's it's bigger in area than Stonehenge. The individual stones aren't quite as big, but you can see some of them along the top. Many of the of them have been uh, dismantled because <laughs> the villagers used them as um, the vi villagers like three hundred years ago used them as stones to build their cottages with. So they actually destroyed. Um, uh, there's a really fascinating picture of what it looked like just before the dismantling process took place. And it spreads out over like a half a mile. Mm, and yes. Ways and uh, it, you, you just get a sense that this is such a gigantic resonating structure that, you know, um, tapped into earth's energies and magnified it and distributed it for, for ceremonial purposes to fertilize the crops. You know, we don't really know what, but it was a, a powerful, huge enterprise. So, you know, what do you what do you do when you somebody flying over notices this pattern the next day? At the at the time, th this is a more complex one. Some of the early ones were just like circles and lines, not just, but <laughs> you know, they were there. And it allowed for there was for a long time um the accepted conventional view uh, explanation was that there were these two retired farmers that said that they had made the circles by dragging a plank of wood behind them, pulling by some strings, and it flattened the wood and they could map out circles and do things like that. And their story got a lot of airtime to the point where that's what most people think. You know, when you, you talk about crop circles in England, people say, oh, that was those two retired farmers. Those are Doug and Dave. Yeah, they made those. And, uh, you know, it sounds good at first until you take a closer look because part of it is, you know, th this, even this exam, this diagram here, Avery is way too complicated to, to just be mapping out in a couple of hours and, and on a dark summer night. Um, you know, nobody and saw it. Doing circles, the stocks aren't broken. Right. That, that's a, that's another, uh, a really important point that when, there were actually a couple of documentaries that tried to prove that these guys made it. And they, they had aerial views of some of the formations, but they didn't include close-ups because if they had included close-ups, as you say, Heather, this, the stalks of uh, wheat were broken or crunched. It was very messy. Um, and, you know, that's the best they could do. Just go one, down one more. There's another... Uh, similar thing that, that at the top, that dark cluster at the top is Stonehenge, which, you know, is a, is a large monument. But again, literally the next day across the street was this, I think it's 400 feet across, incredibly complex geometric pattern. It's a logarithmic spiral with 
fractal rep uh, repetitions. And, you know, it would have taken weeks to, to draw that out, let alone to, to make it by any, you know, just no way that could be done and certainly could not be done in a way that um, maintained uh, the integrity of the stocks of wheat. So, um, you know, in my, my travels, my wife and I have had an opportunity to see some of the crop circles firsthand. And then the next slide, um, yeah, this this is a close-up from inside of one of them. And I included it because it's not just the stalks flattened down. Sometimes they're just kind of whirled up in a, a cone. And, I, you know, <laughs> I really do not even begin to understand how that could possibly have happened. So it certainly knocks the the retired farmer's theory out of the water. But well, it, and Rick, you mentioned in your book how you actually, I mean, you're a very experienced long-term meditator and that you actually went and meditated in one of these crop circles and felt the power of the energy and how much it dropped you into a deep meditative state. Right. I think that's that's another form of evidence for me it was clear but um i think the way i describe it was that you know i'm fam familiar with the different levels of meditation and how things quiet down and you connect up and i i said that within two or three minutes of sitting in in one of these circles i had attained a depth of meditation that usually takes three quarters of an hour an hour to get to and you know honestly part of it was i was excited just cognitively and psychologically but also there's just something else that's happening and you know I'm, many people have reported things like that you get everything from pain relief um to you know the other end of the spectrum for some people it's a very overwhelming um experience and they can have um anxiety attacks um paranormal phenomena happen happen people have psychic experiences uh, i had a very interesting synchronicity happen at, at one where you know, these are open to the public there are, you know there's, there's a, often a road that you can get out and walk to farmers generally don't mind as long as you don't, as you don't mangle the rest of the field you know and just follow the, the tram lines to get to it but there was another fellow there that my wife and i got to talking to and it turns out he's a physician also he was an endocrinologist and the endocrine glands are a series of glands in the body that are located exactly where the chakras, the main energy centers are. They're the, the Western medical parallel to the chakras. Um, so he was studying the physical version of the energy stuff that I was also studying. Um, plus, he was bald and Jewish. So there's also those those similarities, too. But it's just, you know, the fact that we happen to come together at the same time and we stayed in touch and you know did some collaboration over these so it's a synchronicity you know you could say well it's just a coincidence but when things like that start to happen frequently at some point you say something else might be going on here absolutely so, yeah yeah so that that's the kind of thing that the i've experienced with um subjectively in crop circles um there are websites that the crop circle connector.com which has archives of the pictures and it's just so varied and you know it's very tempting to try and figure out what does that mean and i know people have tried to say that well this is a a circuitry diagram for an electrical device or a map of the solar system after we ascend or things like that and i don't know about that i mean some of the sources that i've read about crop circles say that there's not a specific analytic content it's more there to inspire just a sense of awe or emit a certain energetic i mean so much of what you're talking about is the biofield the energy field right and I think they situate close to these ancient sacred sites and they may be activating earth energies to support our shifts in consciousness i think that's exactly it heather that um the, the two aspects of it one one is where they tend to crop up <laughs> is um, around places like Stonehenge and Avebury. And one of the sources I read about this says that that's no accident mm -hmm. that whichever consciousness or beings are creating this, 
um, they need a very clear and clean and crisp energy field in which to manifest these designs. And most of the world, it's just the energy is too chaotic and they couldn't sustain the focus necessary to create this. However, in places like Southern England, you know, Wiltshire, where Stonehenge neighbor are, the ley lines and the energetics are so coherent and have been ma maintained that way for so long that they can actually get these images to manifest. And so that's what, that's an explanation for why they happen there. But what they're doing is implanting a new frequency, as you said, a new frequency into the earth's field for the benefit of the rest of the earth. Because obviously, whoever could do something like this, if they had evil intent, you know, we had not, there's nothing we could do to stop them. So there's something benevolent about it. And I, I like that um, explanation that these are new, you know, you, you could call it a frequency, you could say it's a new emotion, a new way of considering things and um i think it's really having an effect the media has not done a good job of spreading the word it's really one of those un unusual phenomena that don't fit into the uh, conventional oh absolutely paradigm so it gets suppressed and um because you know, that's I a worldwide phenomenon also it's not only in um the uk but it's around the globe Correct. Yeah. It's it for whatever reason the majority is in England, but you're right, it's been in every every continent, I believe. And you know, most people don't know about it except for they maybe heard something about it. But really this should be look at this guys. And you know, there are people who are writing about it and talking about it, and you can get tours of uh uh Freddie Silva, for example, he does mm, tours of yes. things. Like yes. You see Pringle. Uh, I have a, a my wife gets me a crop circle calendar every year, and every month is a different crop circle image, and it's just so inspiring to know that. Yeah, they're beautiful. Things like this are happening. Yeah, one one more point about the the shafts of of wheat is that we took home a sample of not from this particular one, but but one where the um, yeah, there's not a simple way I can put it on the screen, but. I'll do it with my hands. It's the wheat grows in uh, in segments, and there's a node at each segment before it gets to its full height. And in this particular one, there's the, the root, and then the first segment is like maybe six inches up, and it's bent about a 45 degree. The next segment is another six inches, and that's bent to be parallel to the ground. So the shaft is parallel to the ground, but raised up, and it's it's rigid. That's the thing. It's not like you know, snapped or broken, it's fused into this new position. And somebody made the analogy, it's like um, glass, you heat it, it gets malleable, put it in, and it hardens in this new position. It's like, it's exactly like that. And there's theories about microwave radiation or some other high frequency EMF that that can do this, but how it's coordinated and manipulated and all is, is you know, is anybody's guess. So yeah, I think they're really important harbingers of something. And I I buy the model that we are in the process of undergoing some sort of global shift in consciousness. And, you know, talking about higher vibrations is one way of talking about it. And I think that's what's going on. And I think that also stirs up a reaction in people who are not ready or willing or able to make mm -hmm. that shift. And that's why I think there's so much polarization in in every aspect of our lives now uh politically especially that um you know the old way they're hanging on for dear life but i think there are very powerful forces at work so if we go to the next slide i think it's um this is um a little bit hard to explain but it's there are technological methods computer based methods of measuring group um, coherence across the, even outside of the room that you're in, but at, at a larger distance. And this is, this is a graph. Um, it, okay, it, it, this is research that came out of Princeton University. So they're not some fly by night, you know, working in their garage kind of thing. It was the, the head of the Department of Engineering found that 
um, human intention and attention can alter random processes. It's basically like flipping a coin and wishing for heads and it happens more often, but it's done at a micro level. A computer just generates a stream of random ones and zeros, thousands per second. And, you know, they distribute around as as many ones as zeros, but they've found over years of research that people focusing their intention on these devices can shift mm-hmm. away from 50-50 in ways that are highly significant statistically and can't be just due to chance. So they they actually went out and um, built it into a, a global project where they distributed these computers with the, the programs inside and 50 or 60 labs around the world and have it running continuously. It's called the Global Consciousness Project. And there are times when the, the computers go nuts. And sometimes it correlates to, a lot of times it correlates to well-known events. This, this is a diagram where it's not that well-known an event, but it had a significant effect on global consciousness. This, The blue line is um, sort of the threshold for calling something statistically significant. If it, anything above that line is statistically significant. You're reading from left to right is the flow of time. And these are measurements taken during what was known, what is known as World Sound Healing Day. It's coordinated by a sound healer named Jonathan Goldman, mm-hmm. based in Boulder now. And he's got thousands of followers around the world who agreed on this particular day, we'll do this particular kind of humming meditation. And <laughs> somehow or other, uh, the 61 different units, they're called eggs, um, event generators um, became synchronous to a degree that's way, way, way above what would be from random chance. So this shows that um, we're all interconnected. That's that's the main finding, that we're all interconnected and that having a particular intention, behavior, emotion can affect, can affect um, everyone. And even if they're not in the room, even if they have no physical connection to you there are other kind of the ethers you know the invisible the noosphere as um Teilhard de Chardin called it there are ways that our intention spreads out in ripples across the world Mm -hmm. so this was you know one day of positive vibration um you know the question is what happened what would happen if this was done more more frequently it reminds me of a pretty well-known study done by the the Transcendental Meditation people, again, this was quite a while ago, I'd say 30 years ago, where they were planning to have a group, uh, a large annual gathering in Washington, D.C., where they would end up having several thousand people meditating together, and they wanted to know what effect it would have on the city as a whole, and they chose to look at the crime rate um, on each day of this, I think it was a two-month intensive, and again, it sounds kind of, you got to be kidding me, but it's it's a published paper in a peer-reviewed journal. And as more and more people joined the, the retreat, uh, I'll try and, uh, I think, yeah, at, at, as the number of participants went up to like 2,000, 4,000, something like that over the course of time, the crime rate at the same time went down, 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 down. And then when, when the retreat was over, the crime rate went back up again. Yeah, Greg Braden's written a lot about that. And then there's the HeartMath Institute, their work with global coherence. Right. So it's it's profound when we realize. And again, it's it's that understanding of morphogenic fields that we can together be having a profound influence on the collective consciousness by being in that higher state of coherence and, and yeah. higher consciousness. And it's not so much the activities, the actions that you do out in the world, those matter too, especially if they carry the same uh, feeling, the same intent, the same vibration. So it's very, it's it's a very empowering point of view because it's very easy to read the headline and say, oh, what can I do about this? You know, forget it. It's hell in a handbasket or whatever. But this is this is a way that, you know, there's documented proof now that you have an impact, even though it sounds, you know, it's very it's a stretch to believe it, but once you immerse yourself in the work, and you you know you mentioned like Dean Radin has done phenomenally about it. The HeartMath Institute is looking at 
how the Earth's magnetic field might be the sort of like the carrier of these vibrations. And as the Earth's magnetic field varies, so too does um, the, the effectiveness of these things. Um, you know, so part of what's, what's beautiful in your work, Rick, is you're such a pioneer and a, and a bridge builder that you're really providing that integration of some of these ancient wisdom and healing traditions with modern science and some of the ways that our modern research is validating what ancient cultures already knew. So it's it's beautiful that you're helping weave that into our more modern understandings. And yet I think at the same time, we're more and more in this time reconnecting with some of those ancient healing traditions that were far more advanced than what we're capable of now. Understanding yeah. of light and sound <laughs> healing, as well as that awareness that everything is a part of this sea of consciousness and energy. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, it should be humbling for people from the Western tradition because we were good at certain things like mechanical things and technological things and external things, but we overlooked the whole inner world to a large extent. And other people's studied it very deeply and we're, we're learning a lot about it. Um, if there's one more slide, if you, if you can um, add that back in, it has a couple of the resources that people who wanted to, to, to learn more about it can, I uh, can check out. But um, you know, I, I, this is my way of pulling things together. There, there are a lot of people who are, who are doing this kind of work and uh, there, there are professional organizations, um, so society for, scientific exploration is uh, is basically um you know studying consciousness and in a parapsychological point of view and um finding that there's it's easy it's possible to document great thanks to document all of these uh unusual very unusual phenomena so these are these are a couple of resources that people might be interested in um, I, I mentioned the, the, the sports focused work on group energies. It's actually viewable now on, you just Google on, go to YouTube and Google the title and you can watch it for free. It used to cost money. I, my articles are, um, available on a website called research gate where you can access them. And some of them are on phantom pain. I describe that, uh, heart coherence experiment in more detail I described uh, a, a time when we went to a baseball game and used one of those computer programs of random number generators to see how it correlated with the events in the game. And it was just fascinating because I subjectively guessed when I thought the fans' emotions were strongest and just wrote down, you know, the moment in time. And then later, car see if it correlated with the output of the computers. And there's some very stunning correlations with, uh, especially... <laughs> There's one point in the game where the Boston fans sing a song together. Mm. And that was the moment of, that the computers registered the highest coherence. Even there's not there's no audio in it. It's not it's not related to that. So it's the energetic that's getting emitted. Exactly. Yeah. So how the energetics even affected the computer's output of, of random number generators. So there's some really, really puzzling but amazing and beautiful, wonderful things that are, that are going on that a, a lot of people are starting to look at. Um, and this is, this is the, 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 the book that's, it's not coming out till um, April, but you can place, uh, you can pre-order it at the, <laughs> either through the book's website or the publisher is um, Inner Traditions. They're based in um, Vermont and they've been, they've been leaders in this field for like 40 more, yes, more. yes, it's a great publisher. Yeah, so they they give it a lot of credibility. So yeah, I just want to, I'm not very good at plugging my stuff, but okay, I've done it. <laughs> no, and having read the book, it's an excellent book, Rick. I, I highly recommend it. And again, because you're you're really coming from that Western perspective, but showing how we can begin to integrate and understand a lot of these uh, understandings of energy fields, biofield healing, 
group consciousness and the consciousness of the earth. And, and I love how more and more that research and understanding is coming out. You know, I've interviewed Veda Austin, who's doing phenomenal research, exploring the energies and consciousness in water. So wow. I think it's beautiful that we're beginning to, to reweave that understanding. And I think part of it that I talk about from my neuropsychological perspective is that we've come through a period of being left brain dominant, where we want to analyze everything and we separate ourselves and critique what the world around us, but we're regaining more of that right brain balance that lets us again, tune into these more holistic ways of seeing and understanding and reconnecting with energy and empathy and being in relationship with what's around us. Yeah, no, that's 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 well put. It reminds me, uh, a version of this talk that I used to give was called <clears throat> Life Energy for the Hemispherically Challenged. <laughs> <laughs> It was, I was talking to medical audiences and, you know, they're, as you say, they're all in the left hemisphere and how to open up to it. You know, sometimes a mind will be changed by a very well done research study, but more often it will be, you know, somebody's brother-in-law had an acupuncture treatment and did really well. And they say, you should try it. You should try it. You got the same right. headache. Mm-hmm. Try it. You know, that That's what, and then they'll have a personal experience and that's, that's what's really helpful. And then, you know, a really big part of this whole process is, People like you, Heather, who have these uh, podcasts and broadcast the interviews to larger and larger audiences, it's really important to have access to information. That's one of the really great things about about the Internet is how information can be so widely disseminated. Well, and part of what I think is, yes, and part of what is really helpful as we begin to understand more of our energy field is not only as you're describing our interconnected with interconnectedness with each other, how we can be shaping the collective consciousness through our own energies and what we're emanating. But I think it's also profound from the perspective of healing that we begin to understand that as, as you were describing earlier, our traumas, our stories, our emotions all impact our energy body, our energy field, that then can impact our physical body. But that as we understand these layers of the biofield of our energy body, then we can begin to understand more profoundly how to heal on all of those levels. Yeah, I think trauma is a really important part of the picture here, especially because of the role of the media. I think the mass media intentionally creates emotions of anxiety and, and, and fear. And, you know, it sells more, you know, get more readership and attracts eyeballs to the websites, but it it also traumatizes the population. It's really important to, to de-stress or just have your, (laughs) your resist your, you know, your, sphere of light surrounding you when you read when you read this stuff i it's I, I enjoy following the story as it unfolds but i think i'm better and better able to filter out the the angst so that i'm not traumatized because as you say that's a really common effect on the global biofield and i you know i don't know how but as you mentioned in the in your book And as I speak about a lot, we are from that astrological perspective, moving into the age of Aquarius, which I think is going to accelerate our awareness that we are energy bodies and we are interconnected with the energies of the earth and the energies around us. So that then it really helps us realize we have a responsibility for how we deal with our consciousness, for how we deal with our own uh, energy field and how coherent we are or chaotic we are, because that is in fact affecting the collective. And I think there, there is a polarization right now, as you mentioned, Rick, and we can either get caught in that fear, which leads us into a lower level of consciousness and impacts the events around us, 
or we can take responsibility for how we're coming into more coherence and helping co-create a new world together. So I think this is a critical time for us to be in our own, taking our own responsibility for how we are working with our energies and what we're emanating in the collective. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's well put. Before we stop, Rick, what just in terms of some of the growing edges in terms of this understanding of energy healing, what, what do you see as some of the directions or advances that we may be moving into more fully? Well, I think I think the basic trend lines are there. It's just more and more acknowledgement and acceptance of it. You know, the having spent the world and my, my career in uh, the world of conventional medicine, phenomenal changes that, uh, you know, Harvard Medical Schools uh, teaches a course in a required course in meditation for students. They have to learn how to meditate. <laughs> you know, it's not like <laughs> not being forced to, but everybody's exposed to it. Um, in our in our hospital, we had a donor fund a trainings for staff in Reiki. So not just physical therapists and occupational therapists, but we had physicians and especially the resident trainee physicians learning how to do energy healing, which is like mind boggling because that's going to affect how their how their practice develops in the in the future. So I think things like this are happening a lot. They're more, you, you know about them more if you live in that world. Um, it's always the sort of the challenge when you go to one of these conferences. I, I'm a regular at the energy psychology conferences where mm-hmm. tapping-based therapies of psychologists mm-hmm. that are using EFT. EFT, right, and t- things like that. And then, you know, everybody is excited and jazzed up there. And then you go home and nobody knows what you're talking about. And it's, I mean, if you're an astrologer, it's probably something similar. And so... You know, it's it's changing, but it just it just does take a while. And um, but I think it's the like right now. I don't know how time focused your astrological um, charts are showing, but it really seems like right now, like this next year or so, is really crucial for for a lot to determine how a lot will play itself out. Yes, well put. I just put out a video, kind of projecting out the next few years. And I think now, between now and the end of 2024 is really a critical karmic choice point for us individually and collectively. And then there's going to be a big shift at the end of 2024. But yes, I I think this is an accelerated time of change. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing, Rick, and that you've shared it with us today. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And thanks again, Heather, for the opportunity. And thanks to all of you listening.